Greetings and welcome back to room 303 in our talks with Walt as we are calling our readings to the deathbed edition of Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass. We are in Song of the Broad Axe. We are in section number one. Now our assumptions here are that you have been following our stuff at learnstrong.net down that left hand side. Talks with Walt is what we're calling this set of play, uh, this playlist, this set of, uh, of lectures. And uh, the whole, the assumption is that you have your own copy of Leaves of Grass and that you've been following our stuff and annotating as you go everything. We've covered everything from the very first poems and inscriptions through starting from Pominach, which is actually where we're going to begin for the conversation with, with uh, Broadax here in a second, all the way up through and including Song of Joys, and then we've given a set of introductory comments for our study of the 12 sections of Broadax. So I hope that you've been able to have a, a little bit of an exposure to that. Now we said in the last lecture of introduction that one of the interesting things about this set of lines from the very beginning, and it doesn't happen all the way through the poem, but Whitman will begin with a certain kind of rhythm and rhyme, which is going to be kind of surprising. Some have called it iambic uh, tetrameter, some have called it trochaic uh, tetrameter. I'll leave it up to you to decide which one it is, but you can certainly hear it when we read it. And obviously the question is, why, right? Like, why is it that he will play that game? And of course, some of it's going to have to do with issues of harmony and unity, as longing as we've said for that. Let's just, uh, since it's a short section, let's read it and then let's just enjoy um, um, annotating. Weapon shapely, naked, wan, head from the mother's bowels drawn, wooded flesh and metal bone, limb only one and lip only one, gray blue leaf by red heat grown, have produced from a little seed sown, resting the grass amid and upon, to be leaned and to lean on. Strong shapes and attributes of strong shapes, masculine trades, sights and sounds, long varied train of an emblem, dabs of music, fingers of the organist skipping staccato over the keys of the great organ. Now I actually want to take us back um, because some of you are already um, like, uh, there's a certain kind of echoing um, that we uh, have to be reminded of. Uh, I know I heard it. Like, where did I hear this? Hey, do you remember these lines? We commented on these already at LearnStrong.net. Starting from Pominat, that great uh, poem in the inscription section, number six. He says it this way. I will make a song for these states that no one state may under any circumstances be subjected to another state. And I will make a song that shall be comedy by day and by night between all the states and between any two of them. And I will make a song for the ears of the president full of weapons with menacing points and behind the weapons countless dissatisfied faces and a song make I of the one formed out of all the fanged and glittering one whose head is over all resolute warlike one including and over all however high the head of any else that head is over all. Now we've of course talked about this. I just want to comment on two times that word gets used that's the first word of Song of the Broad Axe, weapon. And then notice shapely. In other words, it has to be made. Can we just point this out for our notes right away? Whitman is going to, at his study obviously of history, reminds him of this, that as they say, Rome wasn't built in a day and of course it wasn't destroyed in a day either. But this is the point I think for Whitman. It is, um, it takes a long time, it takes a lot of intentionality to construct this thing called civilization in the same way that it takes a while to build an axe. I mean, you've got to have two things to have an axe, right? You've got to have the wood, and uh, we already commented on uh, Metz and Yahoo's classic line, from the forest itself comes the handle for the axe uh, from Chop Em Down. Um, this idea that the weapon has to be constructed shapely. And then, ironically, he uses the word naked, which takes us immediately back to Song of Myself, Passage 2. We all remember that he talks about being naked and running along the beach in Song of Joys. And then he uses this strange word, uh, one, um, which actually is only used one other time in Song of the Redwood Tree, but it suggests something weak, something uh, maybe um, exposed even from naked and wan. And then a strange line, and this is, uh, again, we find these little kind of 
really remarkable little things hiding away in leaves of grass. This line is so bizarre. He says about the axe, and especially the axe's head, head from the mother's bowels drawn. Now, obviously you can see this as he's talking about the metal comes from Mother Earth. There have been readers who have seen a certain kind of sexual on, um, connotation here. Even a Freudian and possible Oedipal reading. I'll leave that one all up to you to consider that one. But notice the idea that from the earth is derived, again, the, the, this metal that can be used as a weapon or as a tool, depending upon, obviously, your orientation. Wooded flesh and metal bone. Now all of a sudden you begin to go, ah, I've, we've seen this before in our reading of Lisa Grass, where he'll take something physical and begin to sit, uh, kind of like metaphysical. It's almost like he spent a lot of time reading the poetry of like a John Donne, one of the metaphysical poets. Go back to Valediction, Forbidding Morning, and the Conceit of the Compass, and in our comments at LearnStrong.net to play that game. Limb, only one, and lip, only one. Go back to, again, John Donne's uh, Valediction, Forbidding Morning, when I held up that compass and I asked you guys, is it two or is it one? Well, there's two legs, but it's actually just one. Notice here, we'll have two parts to the axe, the handle and the head, right? And yet, are they one or are they two? By the way, notice, one gets used twice in this line, the idea, obviously, unity. Gray blue leaf, obviously leaves of grass, comes to mind by red heat grown. In other words, the only way you're going to get a, an axe head is you've got to melt it. And that idea of melting, again, John Dunn's valediction for bedding morning comes back. Helv produced, that is to say, the handle, the only other time this word gets used is in part eight, uh, section 8 of this poem, produced from a little seed So, So there's your irony of all ironies, right? Again, from the forest itself comes the handle, the, the source of the handle for the very axe that would cut down the tree. In other words, you plant this little seed. This seed will grow into a big tree. The tree is chopped down so that you can get a handle for an axe. They're all kind of ironies, obviously implying, implied in this observation. Then he'll continue resting the grass amid and upon. In other words, the axe itself can be laid on the grass, but also in the grass. And immediately I, we, we have to start thinking about Song of Myself, Passage 1, and of course Passage 5, that very radical Passage 5 to be leaned and to lean on. Now, I have made the argument in our study of Leaves of Grass so far that there isn't any way that you can really read, I, I believe, T.S. Eliot's poetry, especially four quartets, without a close study of Leaves of Grass. And you'll remember in those opening lines of Burton Norton, that is, uh, those, uh, after those opening lines of time present and time past, or both perhaps present and time future and time future contained in time past, you'll remember he says it, my words echo thus in your mind, but to what purpose? Uh, I think this echo here is intentional for Whitman, taking us back, of course, especially to Song of Myself, and the leaning on uh, to leaning and uh, to leaning on the grass, and then the grass somehow leaning back on as well. That is to say, the yin yang symbol comes to mind in our study of William Blake. This notion that there's an interesting symbiosis between opposites, and we're definitely going to see that here. The axe as both weapon and tool, in the same way that we could make the argument about civilizations, right? The positive and the negatives, we might say. Strong shapes, circle that word, because we're going to come back to it in passages 9, 10, 11, and 12. Over and over again, we're going to hear the word shapes. And attributes of strong shapes. This idea of attributes has been one of the central notions of our study of leaves of grass. What is it that we can attribute to America as a great civilization? What are those attributes? What are the attributes of the strongest kind of country? Or in this case, in this poem, it's going to be the cities. What will be the strongest cities? Masculine here just simply over related to power and assertiveness. We're going to get to that notion later in this poem. Masculine trades, sights, and sounds. And if you'll think about it, all the leaves of grass have been, has been an attempt to try and capture all the sights and the sounds. Long, varied train. I mean, America hasn't been around for very long when he's writing this poem, barely 80 years. However, this idea that it takes a long time to construct uh, an axe in the same way that it takes a long time to construct a civilization. Varied train of an emblem. This is the symbolism. Dabs of music. Now, in Song of Myself, passage 36, we get this use of the word dabs and it's dabs of flesh. Here it's dabs of music. 
the, the notion of harmony and the notion of music, I think, is why we have this rhythm and rhyme game that's being played. Now, we will say this later at 3.8, but Whitman was actually best known for a little poem called Oh Captain, My Captain that he wrote after the death of Lincoln. He himself said many times, maybe a bit disingenuous, that it was his least favorite poem. Of course, it's the one in many ways that made him the most famous. Uh, but he didn't like it because it reminded him too much of the poets of his own day, like Longfellow and Psalm of Life. Tell me not in mournful numbers, life is but an empty dream, for the soul is dead that slumbers, and things are not what they seem, that nah, 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 nah. That kind of, that kind of uh, mindless rhythm playing that Longfellow uh, liked, Whitman stayed away from it entirely because he said, he argued in his notebooks before he published Song of Myself and Leaves of Grass, that that's not the way normal people talk. However, notice, we are playing the game here with rhythm and rhyme, and why? Well, there's the word. It has to do with music. It has to do with harmony. Everything in Leaves of Grass, in the end, is about trying to reconcile the power of the individual and the longing for the group to somehow be united. Fingers of the organist, you, know, you could, uh, earlier it was the orator in Song of Joys, here it's the organist, skipping staccato over the keys of the great organ, and all of a sudden you realize, oh, he's talking about himself as the player, as the creator, and of course he's talking about America as a musical instrument. Well, how are we going to uh, end this section at 2A with themes, messages? Well, the axe, obviously, both weapon as well as tool. That is to say, just like a civilization, it can have its blessings and its curses. Uh, and to that degree, life, like America, is full of complexities and paradoxes. As we've said, it isn't a simple, it's just simply complex America. And to that degree, Whitman wanted to point that out. The, the, the way we talk about civilization sometimes is in very kind of throwaway terms. And Whitman wants to remind us, in the same way that it takes a while to make acts, in the same way that it takes a while to learn how to play an organ and to play it well, and to jump staccato-like all over those keys, it also takes a long time to be able to construct a country, a civilization. And Whitman's witnessing this as it's happening. At 2B, the rhetoric, well, obviously the rhyme and the rhythm, I'll, uh, and, and it's fun to read this set of lines out loud. I'll let you guys practice reading this out loud. Whitman would like it that we spend our time trying to read this stuff out loud back and forth to each other. At 3A, I mentioned, oh, Captain, my captain, um, um, and I'd like us to think about the power of weapons from the Iliad and the Odyssey and the Aeneid all the way up through, of course, uh, Hunting and Beowulf. We've talked about this elsewhere, all these, all these titles elsewhere at LearnStrong.net. All the way to Song of Roland. I mean, even, even in, a great, in a great French epic like that, it's always about weaponry, and of course, it's even made fun of in uh, Cervantes' uh, Don Quixote. Um, I, I also mentioned the great metaphysical poet John Donne. Go back and take a look at uh, Valediction for Bedding Morning and, and see the way in which Whitman is playing a very similar kind of game. Finally, at 3B, how are we going to own a set of lines like this? Well, uh, I'll ask you this. Again, I'm just trying to somehow allow you to capture some element of, of the poem already. Um, as we begin this, what is your history with an axe. Now I ask that because there can be a very positive history with axes. I've had students that say, you know what, I think I, I think I learned a lot about myself when I had to go out and try and chop up a whole bunch of wood with an axe and I began to realize, man, this is really hard work. It can be a positive experience, also can be a very negative experience. For example, many of us have been injured when wielding an axe. It's a very dangerous kind of tool, no question. And then finally, I'd like you to consider the irony of this line as we quoted it from uh, Metz and Yahoo's uh, wonderful song, Chop Them Down. Uh, from the forest itself comes the handle for the axe. And think about the ways in which that is so true in so many places in our life. So for example, technology. Yes, true, that phone that's sitting there next to you, no question, it's a powerful tool but it can also lead to some really terrible kinds of implications. How is it that we can live with our technology and somehow it doesn't destroy us? That's obviously going to be one of the central questions of this. Now we'll come back to passage number two of Broad Acts and the famous welcome passage as we'll get to it. I hope this poetry is challenging you. Thank you.